Good morning everybody and um, welcome back to my uh, channel. Today I'm going to take you back some 60 or 70 years in time to the 1950s and 1960s of the last century because I'm going to look at these two measurement devices that last week I was quite unexpectedly able to lay my, uh, my hands on them. And these are two frequency meters by, by Roden and Swarth from, um, from Germany. And actually they're quite interesting in, in, in how they work and how they're operated. So today I would like to, to take you with a little tour on these devices. I'm going to talk a bit about how they work, about their specifications, and we'll also try to see if we can get these devices still to, uh, to work after all these years. Um, and if they're still by any means reliable in, in measuring, um, measuring frequency. So let's take a look what we, um, what you got here. Um, the one over here, it's called the, 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 the Rodin Swartz one. Um, and it's a, it's a frequency meter, a resonance frequency meter from 30 to 500 megahertz. So still, um, a rather modest, low, uh, frequency range. It got a really beautiful dial eh, right over here. Um, and we can turn the dial with the button over, uh, over here. I hope you can see it on the screen. We got some eight different ranges here. We got something here where used to be a, uh, a cable coming out and with a, a probe connected to it and that is, um, is missing on, um, on this device. And we see a couple of other controls, including sensitivity control. And it comes in a sturdy metal box. Um, the metal box is the same for those and also a couple of other devices that I got myself from the same period in time. It was a standard uh, case by Roden and Swartz. I think it was called the Normkaster 530. Um, and they can be stacked on top of each other. They have a handle and, and they're really extremely um, sturdy. Um, um, but I think it's, 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 it's looking very well with this uh, big, big dial here. And then on my other side here, I got also a frequency meter. It's called the, the wall. It's written actually here. It's uh, on, the, on the top of the device. It is uh, etched out in a, in a quite funny way into the, into the grip. Um, it looks a bit um, different. This is a frequency meter that ranges from 470 to 2.5 gigahertz. So there were fairly high frequencies in, um, in those days, I, uh, I guess. Well, people were already by then working on, on radar and probably other applications that will require higher frequency than, than the regular type of, um, of stuff that most people would be working with. Um, so interestingly, this device, as we will talk about a little bit later on, um, is also a resonance frequency meter, but it works in an entirely different way than the one we got over, uh, over here. Um, we also see uh, a big dial here. Um, actually, we're going to see later here that this is a continuous dial, so we don't have to switch between different ranges. We got a, a meter over here, actually the same like, like, like this one, the meter for the readings. We got some input-output connectors. You will see them over here. I'm going to talk a bit about that as well, because in those days we didn't have yet the connectors that we all know about these, uh, these days. Um, and there, there are a couple of pretty interesting aspects about the connectors that, that were mounted on, 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 on this device. Um, there's output here as well, by the way, this has output too, that is the demodulated signal uh, output, and there are a couple of other, um, other controls on the, on the device as well. So let's go and, um, and first talk a little bit about the, um, the specifications of these devices, so we know what we're talking about. Now the sheet you're seeing on the screen now shows the main specification of these models of the WAM and the WAL. And as you will see, there are actually two different models for both. The older models for, for both of them were introduced in the early 1950s um, and, um, and an upgraded model appeared in uh, the late 1950s, early 1960s or, um, or so. And the big difference about the, um, the upgraded model, as you see all the way down here in, um, in the table, that it actually introduces some active components um, that are used for a, um, an amplifier, which increases the sensitivity of the measurements that you can do with that device. Um, so they both got a fairly similar um, amplifier stage built in. This also means that the older version of the devices are actually passive devices, so they, can, they don't require any battery or power source. Uh, the later versions can run in a passive mode, 
um, but also can run them in, 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 in a powered mode where they're using the amplifier. And in that case, they're using a, um, a couple of batteries that are, are, are put into the, uh, into the device. Now, for both of the devices over here, I got the upgrade model. So the model that includes the, uh, the transistor amplifier in them, in them. Now, how about the working principle of the device? Both of them are, are resonance meters. Uh, but so interestingly, as I just alluded to, they, they still work in, in a, with different resonance mechanisms. And the one over here, I will dig more into details later, uh, actually got a, an LC circuit. It got a coil and it got a, a capacitor, uh, which is used for, for, uh, yeah, for generating resonance and, and reading out the, uh, the frequency. While the one over here actually works with um, a kind of a tuned uh, cavity. Uh, system and I'll go a bit more in detail on that um, in that later. The uh, error margins, as they are listed by 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 by, by the producer, are, are quite impressive. 0.5 percent all the way down to 0.08 percent for the device over here, which I think is um, it's quite an achievement. As we'll see, this is all mechanically built. Um, devices like this are going to be subject to. Uh, to temperature, uh, perhaps to, uh, to aging, and, um, and more than that. Now, with the device over here, we got eight different skills, and in a moment I'll go a little bit into these, these skills as well and see how they're realized. On the other device, we got a, um, a continuous skill. I um, already said a little bit about the, um, uh, about the connectors. Um, and actually, for, the, um, for the, 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 the one device, the lower frequency device, um, where the connector is missing on my, uh, on my copy, um, the interesting thing is also that the probe that's supposed to be there with that device is a probe that is designed for contactless operation. Um, you just keep it close to, uh, to the oscillator or whatever you want to measure the frequency of and, and via capacitive working it's picking up the, uh, the signal. It's supposed to be strong enough for that, even though for rare cases the manual explains that you can connect it up to, uh, to a device. Um, the other device got this, uh, this specific connector that I'm going to go into detail. Um, and both of them got an output for a, um, a demodulated uh, signal, which is, an, um, uh, which is a coaxial output as well. Okay, let's now move on and, and look at the device a little bit more in detail. And we'll be starting with, uh, with the one over here. And we'll also try to see whether we can actually get it to work. And then later on, we'll, uh, we'll move on to its, uh, its little brother. Right, so here we got our uh, WAM and let's take a look at how it's operated and whether we can get it to, uh, to work. So we got the, um, the big scale over here, it got like nice colorful areas which corresponds here to the um, selector switch here with the, uh, with the arrow. We got the meter that's supposed to tell us when we have hit the frequency. We can adjust the scale over here, so if we are on yellow here this should be like 75 megahertz, um, we got the sensitivity of the, uh, the preamp, we got the missing uh, cable here for the, for the probe, we got a modulation uh, output and we got a, um, a switch here. Um, and interestingly enough it says Ansage Versteker, uh, in English, indication amplifier. So that switch is only for the amplifier part, but uh, the device can also operate without the, uh, the amplifier or without batteries inside. So let's see if, if anything happens. We're going to turn it off here, turn it into the battery check mode. That looks quite okay. Uh, I guess it's supposed to show us something in, within that red range and, uh, and that's actually happening. So there seems to be power in the, uh, the device. Let's actually start to operate it. Whoa, that doesn't look quite well. It goes quite over range. Sensitivity is minimum. That happens regardless of the skill where I'm in. No, this doesn't look quite good, apart from the fact that actually the cable is already missing. So let's, let's go and take a, a look in, uh, in, in, inside. The case can be opened only from the front, because as we'll see in a moment, actually this is a completely a 
a completely closed case that is, uh, is behind that. That seems to be the case for all these standard boxes. Oh, it's, it's hanging on its weight already. Let me do this carefully. There it is. Screws come out fairly easily. One fell on the ground. It is pretty heavy. It's about seven kilos or so. So I'm going to stand up, trying not to damage my table. Take out the interior. Uh, without it, do we have it into the picture? Yeah. So what do we um, what do we see here? Let's turn it around a little bit. What can we what can we see? I think I'm going to turn a little bit. No, there's less. Uh, there might be a little bit more light like that. So you see the switch here, the back of the the meter part. We see the um, the batteries, we got an encapsulated part here, which I suppose is going to include the, um, the battery, I'm um, sorry, the, uh, the battery operated amplifier. We got a closed cage right over here that is right behind the dial. And if I turn the dial, uh, let me see if I can show you that. Yeah, there's actually things turning inside. And if I turn the range, then actually we see things here moving as, as well. So the, the resonance circuit for sure will be behind this little box. Now, as I mentioned before, this device on the basis of a, uh, an, an LC circuit, um, and I actually did find the, uh, the schematics of, of the device, and, and it, it, it's very clear. It's pretty straightforward, and here, uh, shaded in green, uh, we see the, the LC circuit basically that, uh, that creates uh, the resonance for this instrument. Actually, in all honesty, the device we're looking at doesn't work much different here from the little kids FM AM radio that many of us, of, of us used to know from, from their youth. And, and, and honestly, this is the one not actually from my youth. This one was produced a little bit later. Um, but yeah, here we go. Um, you can make an AM radio, we got a LC circuit, we got a detector. Here actually the detector is built around a, um, a transistor, but could be a, a crystal uh, diode as well. Um, and we got some amplifiers, so not terribly different. Well, in terms of working principle, in terms of, of precision, etc. It's, uh, it's a whole different league, I would say. Box here, look how nice the, uh, the batteries look. They're kind of in a tube and held by a, a spring. That's, um, that's cool. I still don't see where the cable was supposed to go. It would come in over here, go somewhere, arguably inside this box. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. That doesn't look quite right. Let me see if I can make this a little bit larger. Yeah, I see here a couple of hanging wires. Can you, can you see that? It seems these wires are cut off. I might not have been the first one to open this. That doesn't look right. Okay, let's go back here and let's start to open that, um, open that cage. Okay, there we go. Let's, um, let's take a look what we see inside this housing. Okay, whoa, yeah, that, that doesn't look good. See, this is broken off and this might actually have gone to the, uh, to the measurement probe. There is other stuff broken off here. Yeah, okay, I'm not sure this is, is going to be fixed uh, today during this, this video. There's, there's too much going on. I need to take a close look here, but somebody has been tampering with this, uh, this device. That's, that's too bad. And, and it actually, like I saw there, it has been cut off. I think somebody used a cutter, so it must have been open, not just pulling the cable out. Not exactly sure what, what went on here. What we do see is that we, we really have a nicely engineered piece of, of mechanics here. So if I turn the dial, basically, I'm tuning here a, a capacitor. Um, and if I, oh, look at that. If I 
turn the range. So I see here a range of, um, of coils and they're actually in a kind of revolver mechanism. So by turning the range button, you get another coil. So these are probably, you know, high precision coils and a high precision uh, capacitor. Otherwise you would not get a, a claim precision of 0.5% of or so on, uh, on this wide range. Uh, so, so they do that basically by having these, these coils here moving from one to one. Um, but yeah, altogether it seems like this, um, this device is not going to work today. I'm going to put it back together, um, but later on I might, um, I might take a bit more time and, and try to see how far I can be, um, I can be getting here. Now over here we have the, um, the other frequency meter for the higher frequency uh, range. 470 to 2500 megahertz and in the documentation for this device we see that that Roden and Swartz calls this the the Deci resonant frequenz messer uh, and I think the Deci basically refers to what in Germany would be the the Deci meter welle um, so that will be waveform from from 10 centimeters up to one meter uh, corresponding to a frequency range of uh, 300 uh, megahertz to 3 gigahertz. So that's roughly what we, uh, what we got here. So hence the, uh, the name, I think. And let's highlight some, um, some features of the device. And let's, um, yeah, let, let, let's start with the connectors. I find that very interesting. Because this device was made in a time where many of the high frequency connectors that we use nowadays did not yet exist. We find other connectors here. And the ones that we're finding right here is called um, the Deci, uh, the Deci fix stacker. Um, there's quite a bit of documentation I was able to find back on it. Um, I'll come to that in, um, in a second. But basically what type of plug is this? This is a high frequency plug. It existed in a, a number of different versions, uh, smaller to larger, depending on what you need it for. And the bigger ones go all the way to 16 centimeters in size, so giant type of connector for, for installation purposes. Uh, this is the, the, the B type, um, which is still fairly big to, to today's uh, standards. Um, even a single type, like the B type, could come in multiple different impedances. So you would have a, a 50 ohm version, a 60 ohm version, a 75 ohm version, and they actually would have different size of, of, of conductors here, um, but they would be allowed to mate together. But of course, then you have a bit of a mismatch in your, your frequencies uh, there. Um, but what is the most important aspect about this, uh, this connector? Um, that this is a, a genderless uh, connector. So it's what we call a, a hermaphroditic type of connector. There's no male or female connector. All the connectors and the plugs are the same and they still fit together. And that is rather unusual, but it does have a number of interesting advantages um, because any cable could be used in any type of connection. Any cable could also be used as a extension cable. You would never have to worry about male, female or employ gender, uh, gender changes uh, there. Now this connector has largely disagreed, even though you can still buy uh, connectors that fit on it. Um, but a later connector um, that is also genderless, for example, will be the one I'm showing right over here. If you cannot see it well, I'm going to put in a picture uh, here. And this is the APC7, um, the 7 millimeter uh, connector, um, which was developed by, by Alphanol together with uh, Ewell Packard. Actually about a decade after this, this device was, was made, I think, in the... Uh, somewhere in the 1960s. And so, yeah, so the, the two connectors will be exactly identical, no male and female, like I said. And the way that you would use it, that one of them you would actually turn the, the shield part, you would mate it to the other one, you would turn it around. Let me see if I manage this to do before the camera. Yeah, that works. And then we basically got the connectors mated together. And uh, yeah, so a very intriguing plug. Um, it would use, um, it was used in Germany by Roden and Swartz mainly, but also by other manufacturers. And it was an official German standard by, by the DIN, the Deutsche Industrie norm. Um, and if you look back at the brochures, you see quite advanced applications and devices 
uh, that were related to this, uh, this plug. Um, on the picture here I'm going to show you a mechanical switch for example, um, as well as some other examples of, of devices and adapters that, uh, that use this plug. Okay, enough said about that. There's another plug that we can pay some attention to. That is the uh, detector output. So the unmodulated uh, signal uh, would come out of, uh, out of here. Um, and this plug here is, is, is not very use, uh, usable anymore either. It is a, uh, let me take a look, I took a note of that. Yes, yeah, called the HF socket 4 over 13 plug. It's by the way also an official German standard here. Um, but not common anymore to use for radio frequency applications because apparently the impedance was not, uh, not very properly de um, defined here. Um, but I, I do understand that this plug is still being used for, uh, for pH uh, sensors and some other purposes. Uh, and you, you can still find this type of plugs around. Um, unfortunately, I don't have one. Um, what is interesting that it was developed out of the 4 millimeter, 4 millimeter banana plug. Um, and you can actually, if I, if I take a banana plug here, it actually it, it, it just fits inside, right? Um, of course, this is then not the only HF plug developed from the banana plug because we also got our famous or infamous uh, HF plug here that you would see a lot on um, on ham radio and, and CW applications. Um, uh, I think from a number of, of, of different perspectives, this is not a very well-defined plug either. Um, in principle, it should be able to go in here, at least when it comes to the central conductor, but then the outer part is slightly too big. So I'm not managing to put it in here. Probably if I take this one here off, I actually would be able to make a more or less mating connector and we we would have a bit of shielding here. Okay, let's see later when I want to experiment with it, what, what plug I'm going to use or when I'm able to actually get myself uh, one. Now, so far about uh, the plugs, the other parts of the device, I think speak kind of for themselves. We got the, uh, the scale here, which is a continuous scale. We got the, 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 the meter that indicates whether we got a resonance there. We got a sensitivity control here for the, uh, for the preamp. And talk of the preamp, here we got a on-off switch, basically where it clearly says that the on-off switch is for the indication amplifier. So this device can work passively, but it has a higher sensitivity if the, the preamp is being used and then we can turn it on in this way. Now let's try to see if we can turn it on if anything happens at all. So like the other meter here, there's a battery check mode and yeah, I see, see nothing at all. The meter is not even moving. And if I turn it on, nothing, nothing is moving either. No, so yeah, might have dead batteries. Nothing is happening at all. So we'll, we'll need to open it up and, and, and see inside what's, uh, what's going on. And, and when we do so, we'll also look a little bit at the working principle because I think there's where it really gets interesting. So it's time to open it up. Let's see again the same mechanism. This one, I actually opened it up already last week. I had a lot of trouble removing the screw over there. There was a loose screw and I didn't want to damage anything, but all the different pliers that I have that I meant for, for mobile phone, <laughs> etc., didn't do much good. So I spent a lot of time actually trying to open up the device. Thinking that maybe it has not been opened for a really long time. Yeah. Again, some seven kilos, so I'm carefully going to pick it up and take it out. It's heavier than the other one, as a matter of fact. Okay, there we go. Let's turn it around and see what we got here. Whoa, that looks completely different from what we saw before. And the first thing that catches the eye is that we see no battery, but we don't even see a battery holder. You see that? There is a connection cable and here is a cable that is cut off. So that doesn't look any good. Who in heaven's name is trying to get a, a battery connector out of here? For less than a euro you can, can buy a, um, a battery connector thing, but it's, it's gone. Clearly somebody has been in here. Um, 
yeah, but that, that, that's something that can be easily fixed. We're going to work on that in, in, in a second. Um, more interestingly, let's, let's look at the, um, at the inside, what we, uh, what we got here. So I'm turning it, bending it a little bit over. We see again a sealed box. There are a number of free stickers here and you actually can make a hole through them for adjustment purposes. That's still, that's still close. I'm not going to, going to touch it. That must be so the, uh, the, the transistor front uh, amplifier stage. Here we see the, um, the rotation mechanism and maybe I didn't show that very clearly in the previous video, but so I think I already told you it's continuous. And what you see actually here is that this scale is moving along. I don't know if you can see it, but there's a horizontal scale moving. So I'll show you exactly where we are on this con continuous scale. That is very nicely made. But we see a very heavy part of a mechanism here. And we see, and I don't know if you could see that when I was just moving it here, a nice set of, 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 of gears, etc. And now comes the interesting part. That's the, the, the internal mechanism. This is actually the, the resonator and this is one of the sensitivity switches that's mechanically in the resonator and the other one is an electronic control of sensitivity that is with the, uh, the, the transistor uh, preamp. So what do we got over here? Actually we got a, uh, a tunable line. Um, so resonance is taking place within that open space. And I'm going to show here a picture that actually comes from the, um, from the brochure of the device that shows it quite well. So at the bottom of the picture, you can see um, two high frequency connections. So there's an input and output. And that's the two connectors we saw on the, um, on the outside. So actually there's an input and an output. And there's a very low loss between the two of them. Then basically there is the... The, 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 the inside, which is a kind of a, a, a cavity in which resonances take, uh, take place. So in that sense, this instrument is, 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 is rather um, similar to, to the type of microwave frequency meter, uh, meters uh, that were popular from, from Hewitt Packard um, that you would use in combination with an external um, meter. Um, I think they were called something like, uh, like candy pot or so uh, after the, the shape of the, the device. So that's a fairly uh, similar type of mechanism. And then on the, on the, on the top we see here a, um, a little line that goes in there and there's a, uh, a crystal diode and that's actually where the signal is being picked up again, is being rectified and, and led basically to the, um, to the meter. And we don't see the transistor stage here. This is the, 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 sch the, the schematic for the older version without that, uh, that transistor stage. Um, so it, it is also a... Um, I love that divided by four lines. So, so I, I've just been talking about the, the, the wavelength and the wavelength from, from the, the measuring range of this device, 470 to 2500 megahertz, uh, will be equivalent to, to 63 to 12 centimeters. But then you would need a larger, rather large device if you would like to, to implement that in a, um, in a tuned cavity. So they, they basically made it 25% uh, of that size. And, and then actually the size would correspond from, uh, from almost 16 to 3 centimeters. And, and that's more or less what we can, can have over here. So this is basically the resonance chamber. Um, if we tune it, we basically see here... Um, this bar here going in and out of the resonant meter, that must be very precise. Like I said, it's like, I think 0.08% precision, if I still got that uh, right uh, on the top of my head. So it must be very carefully calibrated actually to, to exactly correspond here what we see on the, on, on the drum here, the drum uh, scale. And the sensitivity part is basically here. This is picking up the signal here from the, um, from the cavity and bringing it, it closer and, um, and further away. So really great looking um, mechanism. Does it still work? Well, let's, let's try to put a, a battery holder inside um, and hook it up and, 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 and try to see if you can still see something happening when we are using this device. Okay, I uh, moved this stuff a little bit around. It, um, it's a very sunny day here and the sun is always moving and now we're getting into the afternoon so we have a lot of reflections here. Um, but I moved it and I hope it's still uh, going to work like this. What we're doing here, I create a little bit of a measurement setup. Here we got the device on the test. 
and I took a frequency generator, that's a, a Roden and Swartz uh, as a MyQ, and, and actually I think you're going to see it much more during the, uh, the upcoming videos, and I took an um, oscilloscope. Obviously the signal generator there is to create a, um, a tone, which we can try to measure here with our, uh, our frequency measure, and the oscilloscope is here basically to look at the um, modulated output. I also could have taken a spectrum uh, analyzer, um, but I'd rather be able to look also in the time domain what is going on. Um, so hence that I, uh, I took the, uh, the oscilloscope here. And the reason why I also look at the time domain that I'm a little bit puzzling around with the, with the connectors, and I'm a little bit ashamed to, to do it this way. Somebody will, some people might really be, be shocked about this. Um, but I'm actually going to feed the signal into the device just with a coaxial wire uh, which is grounded from the other side, but just has a single pin coming out here, and I'm going to move that in the connector here, uh, and a bit of the same way, I've made it a banana connector on a coaxial connector here, um, and I've grounded the whole thing from the back. This is, of course, far from ideal. This is, is mismatching. Impedances don't, don't fit in everything, and it is, is not, not a very solid connection either. Um, but, well, the connectors did it, uh, arrive in time by post, and, and I want to do the testing uh, today. So I think the basic thing basically to test here whether we actually see whether there is signal uh, being detected by our uh, frequency meter and I've set the, um, the frequency generator at um, at 800 uh, megahertz, uh, a simple sine wave there, it is at uh, 0 dBm. So the way this device works basically is that you just turn the scale here and we're going to try to see whether it gives any reaction. And yeah, just here as I pass 800, I see the scale all the way tipping to the other side. So here we pick up the signal in, um, in question. Um, and it's really spot on on 800. I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to, um, to enlarge this a little bit for the, uh, for the video. Um, but this is excellent. I'm, I'm impressed that after all this time, this device is spot on with picking out my 800 megahertz frequency. I can play around, obviously, with the sensitivity settings. Oh, the signal is now so strong that it always goes out. Um, and the other sensitivity setting directly on the device. But we very clearly picking up the, uh, the signal here. The second little test what I want to do is um, whether we also have the, uh, the demodulated output, the detector output working well. Um, and for that I'm looking at that output with the, uh, in the time domain here with the oscilloscope. And what I see basically is noise coming in. Uh, the signal is not modulated right now. Um, the noise purely is, uh, is the AC line. This is 50 hertz uh, noise here coming by. So let's, um, let's modulate uh, the signal. I'm going to do that with a, um, a 30 kilohertz um, AM modulation. And I'm going to turn it on. And right on. Eh? We see already in the time domain that the higher frequency signal uh, is present on that, uh, that output. So moving now to the, um, to the frequency domain representation and I'm getting 0 to 100 kilohertz. I clearly got my 30 kilohertz tone here. I also got a harmonic of, of that and when I turn the AM modulator off they disappear and they go on. There's still a fair amount of noise going on here. Um, right now that bus is not terminated. I can add a 50 ohm termination here in the line. No idea what the output impedance here is. But what I see here, without modulation, merely noise, modulation turned on, I clearly see the tone and it's harmonic uh, coming in. So, so clearly the, uh, the detector output is um, is also uh, working here. If I would move back to the time domain now, I have to say that 
all the signals are so weak. Actually, this is already the highest sensitivity setting of the, the, the channel. I don't even see anything in the frequency domain, only when I, in the time domain, only when I go to the frequency domain, I see these, uh, these weaker signals uh, coming in. And so altogether, um, I'm very satisfied to see that this is, uh, this is basically working. Um, I want to do um, one or two more tests. I just want to see if this thing also works at, at, at other higher frequencies. Um, and in order to do so, uh, let me first see if, if we actually do see the, uh, the second harmonic uh, here coming in. So let me... So let me move on, 800, 820, 840, 900. And when you see me doing this, I have to go to 1600, you will also realize that this frequency meter is only really practical if you're tracing, hunting after frequencies that you already know where they're going to be. Otherwise you have to be very, very patient because it's happening very fast, 1550, 1600, no, I'm not seem to pick up like the harmonics here. That's great. Let me just see if it, it's set properly. If I move to 1.8 gig here on the generator. I don't know if there's anything either. Yeah, hold it, that was a uh, mistake. Two times 800 megahertz is, uh, is 1.6 gigahertz, not 1.8. Now I set it to 1.6. And we're moving the scale here. Yeah, so it's clearly coming out now. So we're probably measuring 1.6, um, but we didn't seem to pick up uh, really a strong uh, second harmonics from the, uh, from the 800. Now, uh, as a final test, let's also try 2.4. Uh, and let's move our device all the way until the almost maximum of the range. Yeah, we see it coming here. It's a bit broader, the signal, and obviously by changing the controls you should be able to make it kind of more selective and really find out where the maximum hit takes place yet yeah, so you see now we're already considerably more selective yeah so it's a little bit of hand labor but 2.4 spot on so um yeah, excellent. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy with this. I'm looking forward for the connectors to come in and I'll also try to get a proper connection uh, over here. Yeah, but altogether, it's a pleasure to see a device that's some 70 years uh, old or so yeah, still works perfectly well and is still spot on in its, uh, in its reading. So it's, um, yeah, this one uh, will remain part of my, uh, my collection there. Okay, that, um, that was it for today. I hope you um, enjoyed it to take a little look at this uh, rather old but still interesting measurement instrument. Let me also know in the, uh, in the chat below whether you enjoy this type of videos. I might be doing a, a couple of more of them in the, uh, the future. And uh, hope to see you back uh, soon on my, uh, my channel.